is the best of the Paul Feinbaum Podcast. And we welcome you to the program on a Wednesday. Looking forward to spending the next couple of hours with you. And quite a bit of news to uh, pass along today, some uh, of it already out, some of it breaking. But uh, as expected, Jameis Winston is done at Florida State. We'll cover that story in great detail tonight. Uh, He uh, finally announced today what everyone knew he would be doing. Most thought it would be after next Monday night because most people thought he would perhaps be in the national championship game. But uh, Winston uh, going out early, and I think almost everyone is pleased Number one, that he's leaving Florida State, probably even the people at Florida State. Uh, it seems to me it's the most uh, logical decision that Jameis Winston has made since uh, showing up on the campus several years ago. Uh, also, uh, Brian Schottenheimer heading to the University of Georgia as the defensive coordinator. Excuse me, as the offensive coordinator. They have a defensive coordinator in Jeremy Pruitt. Uh, leaving the NFL, some people are surprised. He's replacing Mike Bobo, and uh, he will call the plays for the dogs, who will be his quarterback, is certainly one of the first things he'll try to uh, figure out. number of guests today on the show, a lot of it pretty heavily concentrated from Texas. David Pollack, of course, uh, is out there. He'll join us, Sam Ponder, out in Oregon. Joe Tess, Jason McIntyre from the uh, big lead. Uh, A lot of guests and a lot of conversation, and uh, your phone calls as well at 855 242 7 285. So uh, looking forward to uh, a lot of conversation. We'll uh, go to Athens here in a couple of moments and uh, find out the uh, thought process behind Schottenheimer's hiring. A well-respected coach, certainly the son of a legendary NFL coach. Uh, Spent time, of course, at the University of Florida as a player and uh, well-versed on and in the uh, SEC. As far as Javis Winston, I mean, I, I really don't know what can be said, although there has been a great deal that has been said all day long. Uh, I was surprised he made it to the end of the season in Tallahassee with all the uh, allegations flying, with all the speculation. But he did. Good for him. He survived. He ended his season in uh, a massive defeat, but it won't take away from his legacy. He turned uh, that program around. He made them winners. He won the national championship a year ago, and uh, he made it back to the Final Four. Will he, how he will be remembered? He'll be remembered as a Heisman Trophy winner and a national champ. Gentry Estes is with Dogs 24-7. He uh, covers the University of Georgia. He joins us now. And uh, Gentry, thanks for the time. As always, Happy New Year. Hope uh, everything has gone well. And uh, give us uh, the latest, what you know and why, on the hiring today of Brian Schottenheimer to replace Mike Bobo. Yeah, happy Happy New Year to you as well, Paul. Um, kind of an outside the box hire for Georgia, really. You're talking about a, a guy in Mark Rick who had only had two offensive coordinators uh, in the 14 years he'd been at Georgia, and, and, and since 2007, it was only Mike Bobo, a guy he had promoted. So, really, his first search at this, and I, I think really the goal here was not to overhaul Georgia's offense. I think it was to find a guy with a with a pro style background to come in and just kind of keep doing what they're doing. Uh, whoever was going to get this job was going to come in and hand the football to Nick Chubb and the running backs Georgia has and, and keep keep that uh, keep, basically keep the staff intact. I would believe too, additionally on offense. So I think they found that guy. It's an interesting hire though, just because uh, Brian Schottenheimer hasn't been in college ball since 2000. Uh, this is a, a long-time NFL assistant, long-time NFL coordinator. I think, you know, from the X's and O's standpoint, I, you certainly can check that box. But, you know, with questions of recruiting and things like that, he, he hadn't done it in a while. Just in terms of uh, his NFL experience and his success, uh, obviously, you know, we know where he's been. We know what he's done. What's what's the vibe in, in Georgia about, other than being outside the box, other than, Surprising nearly everyone. Uh, what, what does the resume of Brian Schottenheimer read like to Georgia fans? He has to start with the last name, I think. Um, and in mentioning re- recruiting, I think that in itself will open some doors. You know, people know who he is. People know who his father was as a coach. And, and now I think you've got a guy who has been with the St. Louis Rams, I guess, the last three seasons. Um, 
maybe didn't go so well at the end of this last year, and, and there was some uncertainty there, uh, I guess, about his future. But but Jeff Fisher had come out and said, "Is that I'm not going to make any staff changes. I'm committed to shot." So he had backed him. I think he he had a job uh, with the Rams for the next season. I think. Um, so you know, there have been rumbles before about him wanting to get back to college. Though I, I know there there were stories about him talking to Alabama at one point, and maybe some other schools. And uh, I guess he's he's accomplished that now. He leaves an offensive coordinator job in the NFL to come to college, which which is pretty rare. Um, you know, not to say everything was perfect in St. Louis for him. I don't think it was, but to to leave a solid job and in, in, in the year to year nature of the NFL, where things could have turned around for him pretty quickly. It's, um, you know, I think it's it's a good pull for Georgia, but it's an interesting pull. Let's talk about Georgia next year. Uh, certainly, a uh, nice win over Louisville in the Belt Bowl. That's a better way to end the season than defeat. Just ask anyone on the SEC West side other than uh, Arkansas and A&M. But uh, I would assume uh, Georgia will be the favorite. Uh, talk a little bit about the dogs next year and uh, – what uh, we know, Chubb, but what else? Well, offensively, it it looks pretty good for Georgia on that side of the ball, with the exception of quarterback. That's going to be the question. Uh, Georgia had one of their best seasons rushing the football they've probably ever had, you know, other than Herschel Walker. They have four offensive linemen back from that team. Uh, they're going to have a key receiver in Malcolm Mitchell, uh, obviously Nick Chubb, Sony Michelle, Keith Marshall, all good running backs going to be back. What they needed a quarterback. Uh, Hudson Mason was a fifth-year senior. Um, if you saw Georgia's bowl game, or a redshirt freshman Bryce Ramsey came in uh, when Mason was banged up, so I think he would he would be the favorite. But this was such an important hire, Paul, because not only is it the offensive coordinator, but it's the quarterback's coach. That's what Mike Bobo did uh, before being hired at Colorado State. So really, this this is aimed at the big question, not just for Georgia's offense, but probably for the entire team. I, I think defensively. They improved a good bit uh, under Jeremy Pruitt this year. It wasn't perfect in every game, and there were a couple of pretty sloppy performances that cost them, uh, Florida, South Carolina most notably. But I think that things are, are they've got a, a good nucleus back on that side of the ball as well. The question's quarterback, so this is such a big hire, and now they're bringing in obviously a guy who has experience <laughs> at that position, certainly in, in coaching some big names in the NFL over the years. Chatting about about Georgia, and uh, you mentioned the, the running back. Certainly, uh, even without Gurley, not much change there. Um, but on the defensive side of the ball, it, it looked better at times, and then there were some momentary lapses, of course, uh, in, in a pretty forgettable game in Jacksonville. But uh, what what is the vibe uh, on on Jeremy Pruitt? Certainly, he didn't win the national championship this year. That was uh, that was something new for him. But uh, everyone that I know respects him greatly. Yeah, and, and you know, Paul, with, with the nature of what's happened in the league in the last couple of weeks with defensive coordinator openings, uh, Georgia was going to have to to ante up and, and pay Jeremy Pruitt, uh, I think, to keep him. Uh, there just seems to be such a market for defense coordinators in the league right now because nobody can stop anybody. So D coordinators are, are going to be making a lot more money, and you're seeing bidding more kind of situations, more on that side of the ball. So Georgia up Jeremy Pruitt's salary from 850 to $1.3 million. Uh, now maybe, and you could look at the season and say, well, you know, Georgia 10-3, and three, the defense wasn't that good in a couple of games. But, but the job he did, he didn't, and particularly in the secondary, there was a lot of attrition in – just some real question marks. They were having to play a walk-on started back there. Some other from freshmen started back there. It was really a work in progress uh, with what he inherited from Todd Grantham. So I think he did a good job there in, in some key games. I, I think what he did was focused more maybe in, in losing weight, having a quicker, faster defense, and I think that benefited Georgia against some spread teams that they faced. Uh, some of their best games defensively were against Missouri, Auburn, Clemson, teams like that that wanted to go up tempo and get him worn out, and I think George was in good shape and handled it well. Uh, it, was, it was the more physical opponents like Florida and Georgia Tech that play, ran, him, ran over him a little bit, pushed him around some. So I think Georgia needs to find that balance of, you know, we need to be conditioned and, and be able to, to play everybody. And I think that will be the goal going into this year is, is maybe to uh, 
just just to be more well, well-rounded. But that comes with depth. That comes with an increase in talent and recruiting. And Jeremy Pruitt has, has done an outstanding job recruiting probably more than any, anything else. And finally, the schedule. It's always important, but uh, it looks pretty manageable. Uh, a lot of key games at home, such as South Carolina. The Obviously, the Al- Alabama's back on the schedule. That game uh, is in Athens. Missouri is there. But road games at Tennessee, Auburn, and Georgia Tech. And, and a pretty... Uh, Pretty pretty soft non-conference schedule. Agree? I think so. I mean, you have Georgia Tech every year, but uh, you're not opening with Clemson as Georgia's done the last couple of years, and that was always the big big battle to start off with. But uh, you know, you had Alabama on there though, and that, that's a big difference as well. Georgia and Alabama haven't played in the regular season since 2008, and they will next year in Athens. So that would, I think, really, when you look at Georgia's schedule. It's not front loaded as much this year. Um, you know, and Steve Spurrier has been saying, and he makes the joke of you want to play George early in the year because they always have a few guys in trouble and suspended and this and that. Well, you know, I mean, this is coming from a guy who always played George as second in, in the, on the schedule. Well, you know, you push that game back a week you, against South Carolina, you, your first couple of games aren't as tough. So I think that's an advantage, certainly for a team that has been faced that has faced Clemson and South Carolina those first couple of games the last two years. Open up against the Warhawks, always a much anticipated battle. Uh, thanks, Gentry. Always fun. Uh, best wishes. We'll talk soon. Okay. Take care, Paul. Gentry Esses from Twenty Four Seven on the the news today. Georgia has uh, gone into the NFL ranks, hiring. Brian Schottenheimer. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. And Rich is in Atlanta. Hey, Rich. Good afternoon, Paul. Thanks for taking my call. Hi there. Hey, you got, you got a little battle, huh? Yeah, hope springs eternal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's like the, the Cubs and uh, the old Brooklyn Dodgers, right? Until next year. Anyway, uh, Paul, I was going to ask you, um, do you look on your crystal ball? What do you think the narrative in Destin at the coaches' meeting is going to be this year? If you recall last year, you had a lot of conversation about um, the scheduling, uh, the, uh, the permanent crossover, nine-game conference schedule, uh, the, uh, the Power Five stuff. What do you think it will be this year, if you can look in your crystal ball, like I said, knowing that there was a reality – of what happened this season with the SEC, and it wasn't good. Do you think it's an overreaction or an aberration? Where, yeah, what do you yeah. think is going to happen? I'll tell you, Rich, uh, today, six days later, it doesn't seem as dramatic as it did last Friday. Um, per your question, I still think scheduling is, is on people's minds. I mean, just listening, looking at Georgia's schedule for next year, it's pretty underwhelmed, starting with – ULM, Southern, uh, I mean, Georgia Tech is a, is a traditional rival. I get that. And, uh, and that tech this year makes it a little more difficult. But I think you're going to hear a lot about that. You're going to, you're going to hear a lot of defense of the SEC, Rich. Uh, I think that's going to be theme number one, that we are the best conference. Uh, no one has to go through what we have to go through. Uh, I think they'll get a lot of support in, uh, in certain area codes and primarily in the central time zone. But I think a lot of the people in the country, depending on what happens Monday night, uh, will right. uh, will not be paying much attention. And the reason I say that, the SEC cannot win Monday night either way. And here's why. If Ohio State wins, it's Big Ten is back, even though most are already saying that. If the if Oregon wins convincingly, then you'll get the argument the Pac-12 has eclipsed, eclipsed the SEC. So take your pick your poison. Right. Well, I'm, my biggest concern, Paul, would be losing the benefit of the doubt, you know, with their with their champion. Because, you know, you listen every day and you hear all these Ohio State fan calls, and I, and I get that. I haven't heard any TCU guys call. And couldn't they make an argument to say the committee got it wrong by not having them in there? And no, they Alabama can't. Uh, based on Rich, the results? Rich, that train left. Right. In New Orleans the other night, if Ohio State had lost uh, by more than a touchdown, as a, you know, anything other than a last minute, I, I think TCU had a, had a great argument. But because TCU beat the number one team in the country, uh, the committee skates. Uh, I, I just uh, I don't think they have a leg to stand on. 
And besides, uh, they beat Ole Miss. They beat a, a battered Ole Miss team. This was not a vintage. Right. This was not the Ole Miss team of October 4th. This was the, uh, the, the Ole Miss team of December 31st. Uh, without uh, Laquan Treadwell, without key defensive players, a team that somehow miraculously, and I don't mean that in, in the literal sense, beat Mississippi State. But uh, that, that, that to me, if you ask me what's the, what are some of the surprises of the season, the fact that Ole Miss, without its, its most important player, uh, at least uh, in, on the offensive side of the ball, uh, found a way to beat a team that three weeks previous had been the number one team in the country. Right. Well, I'm just concerned about the new world, Paul. And uh, uh, scheme-wise, you look at the flagship program, gave up 600 yards to the last three, I don't know, spread, hurry up, whatever label you want to put on Auburn, Oklahoma, Ohio State. I mean, just uh, the quarterback play has been, as you know, has been horrendous this year. I just think that we need they need to make some adjustments this year. And they need well, to but let me ask you, though, Rich, world. it's not like the SEC coaches are – on vacation. I mean, they're still recruiting the best players, and they're still signing the best players. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, a re- recruiting guru, but co- the quarterback position's a little hard to hit sometimes. And but the but the hurry up's the great neutralizer, Paul. Yeah, it stops the rotation, as you know. You know. I agree. So so I'm just looking at all this thing. Well, what, what's Rich, the let me ask you this. Let me this. ask you a question, though. And, and I realize yep. the final the final games matter most. But, it, yep. but going into the, the, the Final Four, Alabama was still number one in the country. They had survived the season. They just didn't survive the game that really mattered. I mean, they got to the championship round, but the, the, you know, they were exposed in that round, which is, which is the round that you get these comparisons, as you're saying. Uh, right. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm still not sure what the final verdict on this season uh, will be. And I, I'm, you know, I will be on Tuesday or late Monday night, but I'm, but I'm still not right now. I'm just hoping it's an aberration, Paul, and not and, and not you know a sign of things to come. Well, I mean, if That's you ask, I, would... I always look at uh, winners and losers, Rich. And let me ask you: You're a smart guy. I met you. you. Who was the biggest loser in the SEC this year? Auburn. Well, <laughs> well, you know, in, in some ways, you, in some <laughs> ways, you are correct. Auburn, I think, has gotten a pass because there were a lot of people. Who argued in the uh, in the off season that Auburn was the team to beat, and we had that conversation ad nauseum yeah. on this show. Auburn uh, Auburn was a major disappointment. Uh, I mean, five losses for a team that was in the national championship game, and uh, but you know, I wasn't surprised, and I'm not a, I'm not one of these know it alls, but I think if any realistic person looked at Auburn's schedule, and, and I saw defeats, I, there was no way around it. And right. to to Auburn's credit, uh, they survived. Uh, for a very long time, they hung on, and it wasn't until the A&M game that it went up in smoke. Right, they just got worn out. Well, that's yeah. always been the argument about the conference, which is why they don't schedule so many Power Five teams yeah, out I, of conference. I, here's what I think: I think another loser, and I, I'm still in favor of, but I think the nine-game schedule has been damaged a lot because. The coaches will argue, we, we didn't survive the eight-game schedule. How could we add another game to that? Right. Well, to me, though, that's always been designed for the lower part of the conference mm-hmm. to get to the six-win plateau, right. not necessarily the top of the conference to get, you know, 12, 11 wins as opposed to 10, if you will. No, but I get I, you. I've always but, but, thought but by that the way, I, Back to my, my – my, I'll answer my question. I think Alabama was the big loser because Alabama – had everything in front of them. They they survived the gauntlet. They survived a loss in early October. They survived LSU. They survived a scare from Mississippi State. They survived a scare from Arkansas. They survived being way down against Auburn, and they couldn't put it together against a team that I still think they should have beaten. Okay? I agree with you. And I want to bring that up. But anyway, I mean, they did. They did. I mean, sometimes, you know, I think the question that I have is, uh, you know, would Alabama have beaten Oregon? Um, I don't think so. No, I really don't. Uh, I think again, I say that before seeing Oregon and Ohio State. But after watching Oregon against Florida State, I had my doubts uh, that Alabama could have beaten them. But again, uh, you give Nick Saban 28 days to prepare. And he's 0-2 the last two years. 
Hmm. Let's uh, check out Michael. Is up next. Hey, Michael. Paul. Paul, hi. I, I think you would make a good GM on an NFL team. You can make a hard decision. You're a blunt guy. And I think uh, on your show, the weakest link is Jim from Tuscaloosa. If you had to fire somebody, Jim would be the guy. Now, let's say you're Nick Saban, and the board forced you to fire one of your coordinators, either Kirby Smart or Lane Kiffin, to fix the problem. Which one would you fire? Well, that, that is a really uh, difficult question. You're saying I have to fire Lane or Kirby, right? Right. I, I actually think it's a pretty easy decision. Kirby? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I would do. I, you know, this guy, he's given up so many yards the last two games. And last year, he did the same thing against Auburn, and Nick Saban himself has said the defense has become a problem. So the guy didn't get a free pass. He's not going to be the head coach in Alabama. It's time for him to move on. I, I tend to agree with one thing. But by the way, I wouldn't fire either one. But, but I, I think Kirby Smart's chances of of succeeding Nick Saban have been hurt. There's no doubt in my mind. I think so. All right. Thanks. I would like to be a GM though. That would be fun. Be an NFL GM. Come see me. You're in. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. And you're no. You're not fired. You stay. Don't go anywhere. I need you. We'll take a short break. But Jim from Tuscaloosa will not be fired from this show. If anything, he's getting a raise and a new Twitter handle, by the way. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Hmm. Are we going to have to change the opening of the show? The SEC is so much better than everyone else. Is that true? Hmm. I don't know about that. Those aren't my decisions, but uh, is that an accurate statement? The SEC is so much. I think this next caller can answer that. Andre in Baton Rouge. What do you say, Andre? Is the SEC still so much better than everyone else? Well, Paul, you know, we live in the southeast. So. Oh, and by Florida. the way, Andre, are you okay? You've been calling this show for months beating up the Big Ten. I mean, I just wondered how yeah. you've been doing since last yeah. week. We're shell-shocked. We're like a deer in the headlights, Paul. Okay. <laughs> but listen, you, we have to win with class. You got to take the losses with class. Does that mean that the, S- the SEC had a bad bowl? Yes, yeah, sure. But does that mean the SEC is not the best conference? Come on, Paul. Wait till the NFL draft. The people don't think this is the strongest conference. Uh, I mean, you know, we've had we we had a down year as a conference, but we got to get a quarterback in the, the LSU. We we got a guy down here that can't hit a back back out of a barn five feet in front of him. They need to run uh, Jennings out of running back to Marietta, Georgia, north side of Atlanta. But, uh, Paul, if people think that the SEC is down, then I would advise them to go to any website, AOL, Yahoo, it doesn't matter, 24-7, and look at recruiting, and they'll be crying in their beer if they think the SEC is going anywhere. The SEC is dominating recruiting again. And El Parsega can come back and Coach, if you don't have talent, you're not going to win. Uh, this conference is full of talent and got more talent that's coming in. Uh, we got to get a quarterback guy here at Baton Rouge. And, you know, I was listening to the guy you was talking to yesterday about Les Miles. Listen, it's put up a shut up down here in this conference. And uh, if he doesn't get it done next year, he's going to be in deep trouble, Paul. I mean, with the talent that's flowing into LSU and you got wide receivers like Quinn and Malachi Dupree and you can't get them the ball. These five-star wide receivers, Paul, five stars. And the guy, you got a quarterback with a 40% completion rating. Man, get out of here. You know, and uh, I, and at Georgia, you know, I, I see they got a new office coordinator over there. I, I tell them good luck over there. I, I like Mark Britt. I moved from uh, Covington, Georgia, to Baton Rouge. And I, I just don't think he's got the fire in the belly of what it takes to win a national championship. He's a nice guy, Paul, but this is not a nice guy business. This is about W's and L's and, you know, and, and big game wins and stuff like that. Uh, Paul, what do you think about that play uh, with LSU against uh, Notre Dame, that fake uh, uh, field goal? And they, they called it a uh, 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 it wasn't a touchdown. It ruled it wasn't I, a touchdown. I thought, uh, listen, I'm not an official, but I thought it was a touchdown, and I think most people – believe it was. Uh, I mean, the NFL comes out and admits when it's wrong. I wish someone would right. admit that was the wrong call. But, but Paul, the SEC, actually, the people think it's taking a step back. It's not. It, according to recruiting, the conference really is Yeah, but let me, well, hold on a second, Andre. And you know, Listen, I, I know where I, I work, 
Right. Um, and I don't need to uh, flash my SEC credentials to anyone or anybody, but I think the SEC did take a major hit, and I don't think we need to be defensive about it. Uh, you know, well, saying we're you know, saying we're going to win in recruiting. I mean, I, the SEC had an opportunity, Andre, to oh, show yeah. the world what it's all about, and it failed last Wednesday and Thursday. So why the excuses? Why, why can't we just admit that the SEC got run over by inferior conferences at the time, and maybe they're not so inferior now? Well, listen, Paul, we lost. We lost as a conference. Yeah. But one year of losing does not mean... Well, but what do we judge? Is this, a, is this a lifetime achievement word, Andre, or are we talking about this season? We're talking about this season. We Let me ask you a question, Andre. The yeah, national ahead, championship is next Monday night. Ohio right. State and Oregon. Right. I don't see an SEC school in there for the first time since 2005. That's not exactly yeah. progress, my friend. Listen, Paul, I, to be honest with you, and I watched that TCU game, but I don't think if Alabama was playing TCU, I don't think they could have won that game. Okay. You know, that was, well, that's, that's, then, why are we, that's, then why are we beating our chest and screaming, SEC, SEC, SEC. Why don't we just admit that that uh, someone else is catching up? Why do we have to well, keep saying, "Hey, we'll we'll beat you in recruiting"? We have. The, I mean, that's that's well, all true. But when it really mattered, when all these and by the way, uh, the SEC beat everyone last year too. Three of the top four were SEC schools. The year before, three of the top five or six. So, the SEC has gotten the players over the last four or five years. What's happening then? It's been. Two consecutive years, last year Auburn threw up uh, at the end of the uh, national championship game against Florida State. This year Alabama couldn't close the deal. Ole Miss got run over. Mississippi State was humiliated. Auburn lost on a last-second shot. Uh, LSU lost on a last-second field goal. So, I mean, what are we talking about here other than the reality that the SEC is being challenged across the board? Put our tail between our legs like a whoop dog and take our whooping like a no, man. No, I'm not saying we have to, but I, but I just think we have to be realistic. And you know, after you lose and get humiliated uh, in the Power Six, in the Power, in the in the uh, in the New Year's Six games, and you right. come back here the next day and say, "Hey, Paul, we're beating them in recruiting." Okay, well, we were beating them in recruiting last year, and the year before, and the year before we, that. We one year doesn't mean the conference is down. Well, it's two, by the way, it's, it, it's been it's been two years. It's been two years now. Well, yeah, last year though we had actually had a pretty good bowl season last yeah, evening. Uh, last year, we meaning the SEC lost the national championship when uh, when when, when yeah they, they they did choke. You're absolutely right. They choked. They choked. So they what did Alabama what did Alabama do this year, Andre? They folded up like a wet tent, but. We got to come back next year and regroup okay. all and let this thing go over. I um uh, I like to see. I'm gonna watch the game and if Ohio State wins, more power to the Big Ten. And if uh, Oregon wins, then hey, more power to the Pac-12. Uh, I think we'll be fine as a conference. Though, okay. Paul. We took a shot this year, a good shot. We got a, a good, good, good shot this year. We got to regroup and come back next year and hopefully okay. this thing will be better. But I, I'll tell you one thing: I would like to see Paul. And I like to see the conference schedule more stronger out of conference games instead of seeing some of these weak games like ULL and ULM and games like that. No, you need to uh, schedule games against the Power Five conferences, Paul, and out of conference games. Hey, Paul, thanks for taking my call. Listen, one more thing. I'm down here in Bell Chase, Louisiana. It's about 30 miles below New Orleans. I just saw a girl walking down the street in a bikini, Paul. Sounds good to me. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. We're getting closer to that season. Uh, Michael is in Jackson, Mississippi. Hey, Michael. Hey, Paul. Uh, hi, Toddy. Uh, I called back in the summer, and I said, uh, look at the schedules in the Egg Bowl. It might be pretty uh, special this year. So uh, I got that one kind of right. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, all right. I have two things for you. Number one, I have two coaching names for Georgia, if you want to put them down. I have, uh, how about Mac Brown or Jim Tressel? Michael, uh, as, as far as future uh, coaches? Exactly. Hmm. What do you do for a living? I am a student right now. Okay, good. I'm glad you're not running a company with that, with that, with that mindset. <laughs> Neither will happen, but I appreciate your call very much. Uh, Steve is next in uh, Indiana. Hey, Steve, good afternoon. Hey, Paul. 
uh, I was calling about, I heard you was talking about the, the best quarterback in the SEC and you was mentioning Tim Tebow. Yes. I have to disagree with that. I think the best quarterback in the SEC was Peyton Manning. And the simple fact of it is, if you go to the NFL and you make them kind of records in the well, Steve, let's, let's, we're talking about two different things. I mean, Peyton Manning may be the greatest quarterback in NFL history, but he probably will not go down as the best quarterback in the SEC because he didn't win a national championship. And I don't think he ever beat Florida either. How do you, how do you? No, he didn't. So, I mean, he, listen, I'm a, I was, I was in uh, his father's restaurant last week to that week ago today doing our show. I'm, I'm as big a fan of the Manning family as, as anyone in America. But but I think Tebow was part of two national championships. It's hard to it's hard to trump that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And AJ McCarron was part of uh, two national championships, a big part. Yeah, you're right. I'm an Alabama fan. I'm I was born and raised in Alabama. I moved up here in Indiana in '81, so I've been up here since '81. But I'm a big Alabama fan. and I live in the Big Ten country, and they're on me like stink on crap up here, <laughs> you know and I just and uh, another thing, and I I agree with you about the SEC has been down for the last two years, and I think it's because of the defense. Our defense in the SEC has been down for the last two years, and if we get our defense back, like it normally is, we'll we'll be fine. I hear you. Hey, good to hear from you. Thanks, Steve. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. We welcome you back, and uh, it has uh, been an interesting program. We'll continue with more calls, uh, but first up, uh, we are going to uh, head out west to uh, Eugene, where uh, Sam Ponder has been covering the Oregon Ducks and uh, covering them quite well. Sam, thanks for the time, and uh, I want to ask the uh, what's the mood like out there? I, I imagine it's pretty good getting ready for the national championship game. It is, Paul, and it's because this team is such a reflection of their head coach. Mark Helfrich, anybody that spent any time around Mark knows he's calm, he's got a smile on his face, never gets too high or too low, and this team reflects that. They're really loose. I mean, that's what these guys have been talking about all week, is that that's the difference between this year's team and the last team that went to the national championship and lost to Auburn. Is They were so tight that, that year. Even though they had great practices, they showed up and then kind of had the deer in the headlights thing. That's not what this team is all about. Sam, you've covered a number of, of national championship or BCS championship games where we have that ridiculously long 38, 42-day layoff. This is a little different there. Everyone played Thursday. The, not, not, not a quick turnaround like we see in the NFL playoffs uh, of, of, of maybe six days, but it, it's still different. What, what can, you, can you sense anything yet on, on terms of preparation, time, just the, the thought process and getting ready for Monday night? I can sense that I, I feel the coaches like it a whole lot better because you don't have all the craziness of the bowl distraction this week. I mean, you hear coaches talk about that. And the guys are going to Disneyland and doing all the fun stuff and talking to the media too much. Um, much of, of that at all this week. Every player I talked to this week and coach said that it feels like it's just – an away game, like a regular week in the season. Now, the one big difference between the two schools, of course, is that Oregon is in school and Ohio State isn't. But they've had their same routine that they normally have for a for a road trip. And the great thing, Paul, is that they've maintained that bowl experience for the Rose Bowl. So the guys still got to have fun and and do all that before of the before the Rose Bowl last week. This week really is all about business. I, I realize that that. Oregon, any any of these four are, are happy to be there, but uh, you've been around the, the program for quite some time now. Uh, I, I doubt they were expecting to see Ohio State since no one else was. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that anybody would. Look, anytime a school can get to the national championship with their third string quarterback. Now, I won't, I'm not going to call anybody out right now, but I was just talking to one of the defensive players at Oregon and I was asking him about Cardell Jones and how you prepare for the guy and what makes him difficult to play against. And he said, who? Oh, the, oh, the quarterback. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, he's, he's new to everybody. I mean, every, anybody who says they predicted this is guessing or lying. I mean, I, I don't think really anybody 
prepared for this to be the matchup. But that makes it fun. I mean, the unknown of all of this makes it fun and also makes it difficult for especially the, the defensive coordinator here, Don Pelham, who was talking today. You only have two game like real game action to watch of this guy. There's not much film at all. So it, it makes it difficult, but it also makes it fun. Well, and, and uh, also Oregon uh, sent Jameis Winston out. Everyone uh, reacting today to Winston's announcement. Uh, has that uh, pierced through the hallways uh, of the Oregon complex yet? And if so, what, what has been the reaction? No, nobody's talking about that around here. Now, it's funny, depending on the, the part of the country you're in, I mean, you're going to hear different things. Up here, this is all about Marcus Mariota. We went for a run yesterday on campus, and everywhere you go, there's some sort of sign about Marcus, people talking about Marcus. I mean, that's the guy they care about. I actually think that that piece, I don't know if you saw it, Paul, that Tom Rinaldi did on the Jesus Girls and Marcus Mariota. Yeah. Um, which was incredible about O'Hara Catholic School here and uh, their their passion about Marcus Mariota in the you know fourth grade. Um, that's what everybody cares about here. So no no Jameis talk yet. Although I don't think anybody's too surprised. I, I know this is supposed to be about Oregon, but I, I, I was with you every weekend last year, and uh, you were getting ready for motherhood. Uh, you had your baby, and uh, people have seen you carrying it. Uh, what can you tell the the, the it's a, world it's a out girl. there? She's, yes. she's not an it, Paul. Okay. Come on now. <laughs> what can you tell the world about uh, Sam Jr.? <laughs> Sam Jr. Well, that actually kind of sounds like a boy. No, um, our daughter's name is Scout. That's actually a nickname. She was named after the little girl in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. But her real really? name is Bowden after Bobby Bowden, of course. Everybody sure. thinks that Christian named her because he played at Florida State. But it was actually my idea. I've always had a ton of respect for Bobby Bowden and just the kind of man he is and the kind of the kind of coach he was that really cared about players and their development as young men. So uh, I guess it's weird to name your daughter after an, an old football coach, but, uh, but we did it. And she's a trooper. She loves college football. Uh, she doesn't really have much of a choice. And tomorrow when we fly from Eugene to Dallas, for the national championship. That will be her 70th flight. So uh, I'm sure if she could talk, she'd have some stories. Well, yeah, don't, don't feel, listen, I'm not, I'm not drawing any comparisons, but pretty much every other dog in the state of Alabama is named Saban. So it's okay to name, after, name, name your daughter after a coach. <laughs> well, that, Paul, that's what everybody said when they actually asked Coach Bowden about it. I think he said, I've had pigs named after me, <laughs> dogs, everybody's animal, but never a baby girl. So I think we're the first. Well, being a, being a writer and, uh, and, and obviously a fan of, of Harper Lee and that being my favorite book, uh, along with most of the free world, uh, uh, I'm assuming there's a connection uh, in, in your house as well to, uh, to Kill a Mockingbird. What is it? Yeah, that, I mean, that was always my, my favorite book growing up. A lot of it was because my dad uh, is an attorney. Um, he's also a coach, but he's an attorney by trade. And so Atticus Finch in that story, that was kind of how my dad operated. I mean, he would do work for, like, haircuts instead of people paying him. And, and that was just the kind of guy he was. And I remember when I first read that book, I think maybe it was in sixth grade, and reading about Scout and the kind of girl she was, just an adventurer who loved – people and and was curious and and interested in the world a little bit of a fighter i don't want my daughter to be too much of a fighter but uh have a little a little spark to her that's that's something i've always appreciated so we decided to to name her after her i'm glad that uh, that that bowden scout uh, wants to grow up and and, and be a fighter <laughs> because every, every young uh, college student that I run into uh, wants to grow up and become Sam Ponder, so at least uh, we'll balance it out. There, there's not, not no, they just want room. the job. They don't care about me, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. No, uh, that's, it, that, it's just the job. I understand. Well, thanks so much. It's great to see you. And uh, off to uh, Dallas uh, with, uh, with the family, 70, 70 trips. That's more than most of us have been on a plane in our lifetime, but uh, not a big deal in your family. Thanks, Thanks, Sam. Well, thanks, Paul. You finally had me on after all this time with you college game day, and I finally get invited. I think it's because a Pac-12 team is in the national championship, so I appreciate representing for the West Coast. I, I was just afraid to ask, and, and, and I would be, maybe you would turn me down, but uh, thanks, thanks for being here. It's been cool. I was going to. I knew, I knew <laughs> thanks, that. Paul. Sam Ponder. Uh, used to uh, drive over every, uh, every Saturday morning last year about 545 with Sam and 
and David Pollock. Uh, the Pollock part wasn't much fun. That was on uh, College Game Day. We'll take a short break as I blush, and we'll try to uh, calm down here for the next segment. 855-242-7285. Don't go anywhere. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum Podcast. Let's go to Glenn next in Florida. Good afternoon, Glenn. Good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon, John. I, I appreciate it, as always, you taking Thank my you. call today. Uh, a couple things real quick here. One on, on Oregon and the game Monday night coming up at Jerry's World, and then we'll talk about just real quickly about Jameis. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, a lot of us, including myself, uh, drank the Kool-Aid with the perception that Oregon came in with that soft tag prior to the Rose Bowl game on New Year's Day last Thursday a week ago. It seems like an eternity ago to me. Um, and, you know, that, that perception uh, needs to go away, Paul. And I, I know you've hit on this before. But, but let me say this. Um, I think if you take folks outside of the Pac-12 footprint in the south and midwest and the east and maybe the southwest, that's the perception. Now, is perception reality? In this case, it isn't. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But my, perce- my, my definition of soft, as, as it might have pertained to the Pac-12 with the exception of Stanford, who has a north-south running game and they're very physical, but my perception of Oregon prior to the Rose Bowl game might have been that Pac-12 teams are engineered in two different ways. Number one would be their finesse teams, i.e., they're fast. And number two, they're not very physical. Well, Go ask Mario Edwards Jr., Paul, how physical Jake Fisher was against him on that day. The most physical ball club my Knowles played the entire calendar was the Oregon Ducks. And I, I have to pinch myself to really understand that, to really grasp that. But that is reality. And I think a lot of times, Paul, I, I don't have specific examples for you, but I think some of the soft issue, if you will, with Oregon and the Pac-12 in general, sometimes is perpetuated by the media. Not yourself, but I, I think you kind of see where I'm going here, where that kind of fuels the flames. Um, but if, if people watch that game last Thursday, that first national semifinal, they saw the most physical team on that football field were in all green uniforms. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. What's your take on that? Yeah. Soft by the way, I was uh, I was in transit part of that game. I saw the final quarter when uh, I'm not sure it was a fair read, but I, I've heard other I've heard similar comments from people, and and I, I tend to think that's part, if not one of the big reasons why Oregon will win Monday night. Yeah, and I, I, you know, that, that, that snuck up on me. And I, and again, I'll, I'll give, I'll give their, their coaching, their coaching staff credit and their kids credit because they, they wanted it more than we did. And, uh, you know, I've, I've turned the page. You know, yesterday we had, uh, a tremendous class of early enrollees, uh, walk on campus for the first time in Tallahassee. So I'm excited about that. I, I've turned the page and moved on. And, and part of that is, um, with the announcement today that number five is, is going to enter the NFL draft. You know what, Paul? Don't let the door hit you. Yeah, no, listen, uh, Glenn, yeah, people have asked me, you know, why haven't you said anything about Winston's game last week? I really don't care. Um, I care today uh, only because of one thing. He's leaving. He, he's no longer relevant in the world that I swim in. Uh, he's the NFL's problem now, and uh, good riddance. I think, he's been, well, uh, I think he's been a complete embarrassment to college football. And uh, I've, I've had what I've, I've said what I've had to say about FSU's involvement, but what you said to me today mean it makes me feel a little bit better that the reasonable FSU fans, which I have not found that many uh, in my travels to, t- to Tallahassee and, and, and talking to them throughout the last two years, uh, are maybe getting a clue bag about or finding the clue bag about Jameis Winston. Well, well, Paul, you know, uh, you know, part of my part of my, uh, and, and by the way. Um, to use an off, often used line, um, saying this doesn't give me any pleasure. But when I, when I said what I said just a minute ago, I mean it from the heart. I mean it ardently. I really believe that. I'm not very popular around here when I say stuff like this. But the bottom line going into next season, let's, let's look at 2015. The Knowles are going to be extremely young on both sides of the ball, Paul. The last thing we need is a circus. So let the circus leave town. 
God bless. Uh, I hope he does well. But, you know, our, our problems are behind us now, so let's move forward. It's 2015. Let's, let's go. Great stuff. Hey, really appreciate it, Glenn. Thank you, buddy. And, uh, you know, I think that's very – I think a lot of – you'll hear a lot of revisionist history from FSU fans. Uh, it uh, it happened, and, you know, they didn't get uh, the second national championship. They didn't get the dynasty tag. They weren't able to beat Alabama. They weren't able to beat the SEC again. It's it's going to go down as a very bad memory, I think, for most FSU fans, because I, I've never seen a, uh, a more joyless national championship than the one FSU won last year. Never even made it to the White House. Terry is next up in Northport, Alabama. Hi, Paul. Hi, hi, John. Um, hey, John. Hey, Terry. Um, you know, Paul, you said something on your show yesterday that I that, that I think is very true. Um, you said that is that the further you get away from the from a national championship, the harder it is, you know, to uh, to uh, you know go go back. And um, that kind of goes with an interview that you had last week with Mac Brown. Mm-hmm. And Mac Brown made the statement that he thought that it was harder to build a program than maintain a program. But I think, and I would like to know what you think. I think it's harder to maintain a program than to uh, than to build it. Terry, um, let me let me give you a quick answer, then we'll continue. Okay. I I'm not saying it's ever easy to get to here or to get to the mountaintop in whatever field you're in. I will tell you from talking to people who have been there, from knowing players, knowing coaches, knowing celebrities, knowing politicians and having the fortune to interact with singers and actors. I mean, you do run into these people. I don't, I don't socialize with them. I don't live around them. I don't know them intimately or uh, as close friends, but I, but I have been able to interview them. The most difficult thing is maintaining. It is so difficult. You always hear the line about, uh, you know, lonely at the top, blah, blah, blah. But, but I think that's the toughest thing. And that's why when, when, when Nick Saban wins – three out of four national championships, when Michael Jordan piles on uh, title after title, when Tiger Woods uh, owned golf for a long period, when Jack Nicklaus maintained it over 25 years, uh, Tom Brady, uh, I don't think there's anything more difficult. Uh, it's, and that's where Nick Saban was a year ago when that field goal was being set up against Auburn. He, he, decided, he said to himself, Let's take a. Let's take a. I'm gambling right now to get out of here. I don't. I don't want to. De- I don't want to keep dealing with this team on the other side of the ball. And you know, this year I, I believed he would get back. I believed he would win. He came pretty close. It didn't happen. I don't think next year will be any easier, Terry. Paul, I think you are absolutely right. Um, and personally, I think that one one reason Nick Saban liked this team so much this this year. Uh, and and you 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 probably heard in his in his interviews he said how much he you know how much he liked this team that this this is probably his favorite team to coach is because they didn't do something that some of the other teams had done they didn't just show up and expect to win that they worked hard I personally don't think and I, I know I didn't feel this way I never thought that Alabama would be in the position that they were in uh, December thirty first of twenty fourteen ranked number one in the in the country and in the final four i thought that alabama might had a shot at making the final four i didn't know if they would be the sec champion i thought the sec might get two in um but i thought they might be ranked number four but i think this team actually overachieved now i know that we're disappointed and losing sucks and and i'm not trying to make an, an, an excuse but i think if you look back where the team was in the spring and where we were in the fall well, let me put it this way terry I, okay. i'm not suggesting he's going to quit uh, i really don't think he will but I think Nick Saban could walk away today with an SEC title, with a national semifinal appearance, feeling good. He couldn't walk away last year. He was angry. Terry, you've heard me say this. Uh, I I know Coach Saban reasonably well. Some of you can chuckle when I say that, considering I spend spend summer vacation in his uh, guest house. But... uh, I've never seen him more distraught, and I feel like I know him pretty well, than he was last year, two days, three days after the Oklahoma game. I haven't talked to him since last Thursday night, but I would be willing to say that he can look at that game realistically, and he couldn't look at last year because, I mean, he he lost his team last year. He didn't lose his team. He lost a game. Exactly, Paul. You, you you just nailed it. You just nailed it. You, and I am so glad to hear you say that. But 
you know how some teams they just show up, they expect to win, they'll they'll play on the on the hard work of the teams before them. This team didn't seem to. Uh, well, and, and by the that. way, this team uh, this team had a quarterback who 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 was beloved by his teammates, uh, who who really did engineer with Lane Kiffin's help and, and others uh, an SEC championship last year. I'm not taking anything away from A.J. McCarron. Uh, he won two national championships for Alabama. But by the end, there was a lot of backbiting. And you saw that when A.J. McCarron opened up uh, on his uh, on the younger the younger players. He opened mm-hmm. up on others. And, and, and I'll tell you right now, I may have alluded to this, he opened up on Nick Saban uh, when he was making the rounds with NFL camps. And that's one reason, in my opinion, that he was disrespected so much by NFL GMs and why he went so low. He he couldn't keep his mouth shut, and he still can't keep his mouth shut at Cincinnati. And he really needs to. He 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 uh, really should. And because Blake Sims is so beloved, and because he is such a good kid, that's why you know GM all the time makes comparisons between the show the way it used to be and the show the way it is now. And some of those comparisons, Paul, are true. <laughs> um, but because let me say this: on the old show, there's no way that Andy would get away with what he's getting away with, uh, what he said about Blake Sims. And, look, this has nothing to do with Alabama losing to Ohio State, other than the fact that Andy will now keep 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 calling in. But in the old show, he would have been up uh, on trial and well, would have been voted let me, let me off say of the this show to you, for the comment like that I... he made. And he still hasn't apologized. No. And he st- he's a racist, he's a bigot, and he will not admit it, and he calls in like he never said anything. And, and frankly, Paul, I just think he ought to be called, called to task. Well, Terry, I feel like I can say this to you because I feel like we're friends. Um, sure we are, yeah. There is a difference between the old show and the new show. Uh, the, and, the, and the biggest difference is me. Um, I'm not really the same person I was uh, ten years ago or five years ago. And, and you know, some, some people will say, well, what's happened to you? I mean, I, 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 I've... I, I'm, I was out uh, of this show for a couple of months, as you all know. Uh, two years ago, I, I left the show uh, because of my contract had ended. Uh, I was right. required to sit out for three months. And I learned something during that period, Terry. I, I mm-hmm. learned how important the show was to people. I, I, mm-hmm. I heard it was such a – I mean, I, I knew I was coming back. I mean, uh, some people wondered, but, but I, I knew, I knew th- something good would happen. I didn't know what it was. But, but I, I would, you know, I, I would go to the gas station. I, I'd, I'd go to the grocery store, and I'd run into people, and I, I was genuinely moved by the reaction. I heard it every day from my wife. You've heard me say this. Uh, oh, yeah. I think I even alluded to it in, in the uh, much maligned book. Um, and <laughs> no, now, no. It, uh, <laughs> It, it, you just it, it had to a prof- the title. That's all. It had a <laughs> profound effect, and, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I mean, there are days when when I, I get carried away and I, I go home and go, did I really need to do that? Did I really need to say that? But I, I think it did, for the most part, uh, impact me. And and I'm not the same talk show host that I was. Uh, am I better or worse? I have no earthly idea. I can't evaluate uh, myself. That's for my bosses and and and, and the audience to, to to decide and to determine. Well, Paul, let, let me speak that just real quick. I think you're better. I think the show overall is better. I truly do. I, I, I enjoy it very, very much. And I thank, thank God none of us are the same person today that we were 10 years ago. But I, but I do think that Andy needs to be called into account. I think he needs to be shown up for just what the racist, bigoted statement. Now, whether Randy is a racist or bigot, I mean, uh, Andy is, I don't know. Uh, but that statement was racist, it was bigoted, and it was hurtful. It, it didn't hurt me. I mean, I don't care what he says, but I, but I, I believe that it hurt Blake Sims. I believe that it hurts his family. And I can't believe that, a, that, that an attorney who's supposed to be intelligent made a statement like that about a young man and then will not come on national television and a... Okay. Terry, let, let me, let me close by saying this because we do have to go to the break. Thank you for the call. Um, but I will, I'm, not, I'm not here to attack attorneys, um, but just because you have a law degree doesn't make you intelligent. It makes you uh, a lawyer. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Andy is next in Perrysburg, not Oregon, but Perrysburg, Ohio. Hey, Paul. I was just calling. I heard that I'm being called a racist and a bigot, and I just wanted to uh, just, you know, voice my side of this position. Uh, nothing that I have said at any point in time is generated by sort of any animus uh, towards race or any racism. I'd like to remind everyone that 
that my football team has three black quarterbacks, one of whom is from south of the Mason-Dixon line, and we certainly sung the praises of all three of them all year. Uh, heck, at Ohio State, we had Corny Green playing back before I was born. Uh, so I, I, I take umbrage uh, with the statement that was made. It, it's not true. It's false. Uh, uh, it was uh, simply a statement based upon what I heard, nothing to do with uh, the color of anyone's skin. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud uh, uh, that uh, Ohio State is the, uh, the institution that was the recipient of one of the greatest athletes of all time because he was fleeing the uh, racism and bigotry that took place in Alabama, and that's one Jesse Owens. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Andy with a uh, very quick response to uh, Terry. Hmm. Jumbo is calling next in Alabama. Hey, Jumbo. Hey, Paul. Thanks for taking my call. Thank Listen, you. you had a caller that called in the other day from Georgia said that we were spoiled. Let me ask you a question, and then I'll finish what i got to say. Why did Matt Moore hire Nick Saban? He hired Saban because the program uh, was stuck in the gutter and uh, it needed uh, it needed one voice, it needed one leader, and just so happened to be uh, a coach who uh, had been the best coach in the SEC previously and, uh, and had left to go to the NFL. All right, I agree. But he also hired this man <clears throat> to win us national championships. This guy said we're spoiled, and all the Ohio people, I'm sick of their crap. They beat us. Go ahead, go, but the Ducks are going to beat you. Let them, let them say what they got to say. Nick Saban was hired to win us national championships. We won three out of five, and, and that's something that no other school has not done in a while. We are still a dynasty. The dynasty is well, not Let me ask you a question, though, uh, Jumbo. How can you be a dynasty when you haven't won a national championship in the last two seasons? Okay. My, my point on this I, mean, I think a dynasty this, can have a year off, I mean, like, like the Spurs. I mean, they, they, they won two or three. They missed one. They come. I mean, you have to eventually get another championship to continue the dynasty. I thought this year you can easily yeah, take it. Coming, Paul. We're going to do it. Just you got to be patient. Alabama no, is I don't Alabama. have to be patient. Uh, I, I heard that. I heard that. I mean, when, when Colin Cowherd said the, the dynasty's dead. The was Alabama. You said it. Everybody else said it. All the sports writers said it. Alabama is the team to beat. We are at the top of the NCAA football and the SEC, and that's no. bottom line. Okay, and what, is, what does that mean in relation to Alabama's dynasty? Well, we won it three out of five years. Okay. That, that's that's good. We had won it the last two years. Granted, I accept that. I'm happy with 12 and two seasons. Mm -hmm. But this coming year, I guarantee you, we're going to be in the same position. We're going to be right back in there. And then really? when we win it again, I want all these people from Ohio to realize that and, Alabama. And what if and what if Alabama doesn't win it again? Sir. And what if you don't? Well, you know, then I'll just see whatever crow I have to, true, to eat. But I am an Alabama fan, true and true. Mm -hmm. Ohio State is, to, is 14 years since they won a title, and they will not win it Monday night. And if any of them want to argue with me, then argue with me because the Ducks are going to beat y'all. And all i got to say is roll, Ducks, roll. You're going down, by guys. You're through. Okay. It's the official... Uh version uh, of what a dynasty, I mean, I don't know what a dynasty is. To me, a dynasty is you win, you, you keep winning. I mean, that's a dynasty. I mean, no one else can win. Uh, three Pete's a dynasty. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to come up with why Alabama still has a dynasty going. They have a great program, but is it a dynasty? I, I don't think you can take a couple of years off to have a dynasty. I mean, does Belichick have a dynasty? Used to. You know how long it's been since Belichick won a Super Bowl? Long time. Not a dynasty. Thank you for listening to the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Tune into the Paul Feinbaum show every day from 3 to 7 Eastern on the SEC Network or on the ESPN radio app. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance.